Welcome everyone to Leica Conversations. I'm Tom Smith. Um, it's my pleasure to be your host for today's program. As always, uh, there's an advantage if you are here live uh, participating in, in the stream. And first, you know, thank you for taking the time and tuning in and spending some time with us. Our goal with these programs is to always provide an informative, hopefully inspirational, and also interactive program. Uh, but we need your help on the interactive side. Uh, you have a role to play to, to help me with uh, the interview and discussion with today's guest. And so I'll ask you, if you haven't done it already, please chime in in the, in the chat window. Let us know where you're viewing from. And then throughout the program, if a question comes to mind or there's a question you really wish I would answer, please put that in the Q&A window. I'll try to, my best to weave in your questions, uh, what, any of the relevant questions as we go. We also will leave time at the end of the program uh, for a bit of Q&A. Today's guest, Dotan Sagi. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Dotan. Thanks, Tom, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, I, I know people are, are, you know, with you in for a, a, a treat and, and, and in the information side, uh, we are definitely going to have covered. And I, I think uh, from our past conversations, uh, there's a lot of inspiration too. Uh, but before we get there, can I, can I ask you, for people who don't already know a, a bit about your history, uh, can you take us back, share a bit of your, your background and, and specifically take us to, to 2015 when you decided to really take on photography as a serious you know, professional pursuit? Sounds good. Yeah. So I wasn't born in photography in terms of my, my career. Um, it, it's something that I did all my adult life. You know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I had a camera since the age of, I don't know, 18 or so and was uh, serious, you know, in, in taking photos on my free time, uh, on my spare time. But I, I did pursue a career in technology, in, in high tech, uh, and went to, to a computer engineering school and uh, worked for about 20 years, a little more than 20 years uh, in that industry um, while you know doing photography on the side. And I always had this kind of dream of one day, maybe I could just uh, go into photography full time, but you know, it, it, uh, it took me till about 2000, in 2010, I started having a business. I set up a business basically so that I could free up my time. So I, I set up the business in a way that uh, I could take some time off to do more photography and learn more, um, go back to school to do uh, photography. And uh, around 2015 is when the business was kind of launched and I had more time to, to, uh, to dedicate to photography. So I went back to actually to, I took a semester in, in a uh, community college nearby in San, at Santa Monica College and did a semester uh, in um, photojournalism. Uh, and I took uh, a workshop with Matt Stewart at the time with Leica Academy. Uh, and uh, that was before Matt Stewart uh, did all these wonderful things with Magnum and, and so on. And, uh, and I owed a lot to him in terms of what I learned about using a Leica and, and shooting street photography. And, um, and things accelerated from there. So um, I, mean, I guess we'll, we'll talk about a lot of that today. Absolutely. I mean, I, and I appreciate you, you sharing, um, the, you know, the, your influences and you're always very good about that of, of sharing the, uh, workshops and people who have influenced you along the way, Matt Stewart, uh, Absolutely. being one of those. Um, but I want to, you know, I, I think in one sense, you know, you, obviously you would acknowledge you're, you were fortunate to be able to, to arrange your, um, your revenue and your, your, your life so that you could make this change in a business. But I also, I, I got to imagine that wasn't easy, though, too. I mean, once you've had a certain amount of success in, in, in the world of uh, computer science and, and software engineering, um, I, I admired the fact that you, were, you made that choice for change. It's one thing if, you know, somebody's job, you know, career changes and they lose their job or the industry is not there. But you were successful, yet you made this choice to pursue something you had a passion for. Was there anything on the personal side that really you could share that, what was the impetus for that? Uh, I mean, what really brought that to a head that you would do that in that, at that time? Um, you know, I, I, the way I've organized my life so far is, so I, I follow what feels good. And I, I think it's also, you know, in photography, I think it's an important topic also when I teach, I, 
tell my students to to follow what feels good to them in terms of their photographic process. Uh, and I think that that's what it eventually turns into a style for, for people, you know, people always look for their style. But I think in life, so just backing up a little bit, and in my career, I, I wasn't really maximizing for, for money or, or revenue. It, you know, I, I didn't set up that last business that I set up back in 2010 was an app business. And I set it up from the start as what you would call a lifestyle business. And the goal was to earn the revenue to free me from, you know, to, to free me to do more photography. So I think it's all about how you set up your, your goals for what you want to achieve. I think a lot of times people get lost in sort of the race of like, you know, more, more, you know, more money, more, <laughs> uh, the bigger, the better, the more employees, this and that. And they lose track of what's actually important to them. So I guess I was mature enough in my career at that point to realize, you know, I had made that mistake of more, bigger, so on before, you know, in, in, in my <laughs> early years. Uh, and I had gotten to this point in my life where um, my, my dad had passed away from cancer at a fairly young age. And, you know, I had sort of a realization that, that I wasn't immortal and that, you know, I wanted to make use of the years that I had in a way that was most fulfilling to me. So that's kind of what guided me to, to um, shift. To making that, the change. Well, th thank yeah. you for sharing that. I mean, I, I think I, I wanted to start with that because I think a lot of the people who are, are viewing today, we're gonna to be looking for chips. We're gonna look at uh, your, your approach and tra trajectory in photography. Um, and, but I loved this story that you started, you know, really serious, taking it seriously when you're 47, uh, after already having a lot of success. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people, uh, question, you know, can I start a new career? Can, can I go in and make a dramatic change? And you certainly have done that. And before we get into the pictures, uh, one of the very first questions, it's a Leica uh, Academy, like a conversation. The very first question I've got to ask you is what was your first interaction with a Leica camera? Uh, and then we'll get into mm. some pictures. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was shooting Fuji at the time. So this, we're talking like 2000, the early 2010s, like 2010, 11, 12, 13. And I had, I, way back, I was shooting can, uh, Nikon for a long time, and I finally got into mirrorless, and Fuji was my first experience. And that's when the first X-Pro1 came out, and I was shooting the X100 as well. And I really enjoyed the, that um, rangefinder style, you know, a camera. I should say rangefinder style, because they're not true rangefinders. And I had shot a few years prior when I, I was in my medium format landscape phase back in like the uh, 90s, I was shooting a Fuji 6x9. I don't know if you remember that camera, the, the GR, GSW, I think 690 okay. or something like that. And it was a, a basically a, a massive Leica rangefinder is what it looked like. And um, I, I really like that. I, I love that from the Fujis. And I was having fun with them, but I always had in the back of my head, like, I really wish, like, I, I should try a Leica one of these days, because this is what really what I should be, you know, I should be trying. And my understanding is you're in Paris, and I wish to point yeah. out you, you, you were, you were yes. born in Israel, uh, but you, uh, you grew up in, in Paris before immigrating to the United States. So you're in Paris visiting, right. you decide you're going to rent. Uh, yeah, so. A, so like a, to kind of talk yourself out of yeah. the need, right? Yeah, exactly. Convince yourself you don't need this. Exactly. So I was like, oh, well, the Fuji has all these features. I really don't need a Leica. Look, you know, and at the time it was, uh, the question was renting an M9 and I was comparing just feature to feature. And I was like, I really don't need a Leica, but I want to prove that to myself. So I rented one for a long holiday, holiday weekend. And I, uh, with a 35 Kron, I think it was. And I, I just, um, you know, I, try, I tried it for a weekend and, and it was a little bit of a, you know, a learning curve, but it was qu quicker than I thought. And I was having so much fun with it. I did get a couple, you know, pictures that I liked, but more, more so than the results, you know, you can't get that much of a result in, in that short of time. I really had so much fun shooting with it that when I brought it back, I immediately thought, well, my, uh, my birthday is, is in about a month and I, I have to, uh, I have to get a Leica. So oh. that was, I think summer of 2014. Yeah, I think that's that's right. And, uh, and so so anyway, after that, you, you, you come back to Southern California. You per, you pursue a, a photojournalism uh, course. Uh, you you take the workshop you mentioned with Matt Stewart. Um, but yeah. and I also want to you know sing your your praises here that you um, 
were accepted at two of the most prestigious photojournalism uh, workshops in the, in the country, uh, the Eddie Adams workshop and uh, the uh, Missouri photo workshop. And I understand you did them back to back. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what happened is I, I was at the Santa Monica College uh, taking that class and some of the top students from the previous years told me, you, really, if you want to, you know, take this further, you should apply for those workshops. Sometimes it takes a, a few years, you know, you can apply as many times as you want. And often people get rejected and they reapply and eventually they get in. Um, so you should start applying now. So I applied to both thinking, you know, eventually I'll get into one or the other or maybe both over time. And um, and then, so um, I got, um, I think I was in Cuba, actually, I, I went to Cuba to, to kind of do a personal project there. And then I, I got, while I was there, I got the response from both of them saying, you, um, you got into, we you, know, you got into both. With your first, they, they your first like, yeah, your first try. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that doesn't really, that's, that's, I, as I understand it, pretty rare. Um, those are two wonderful workshops. Uh, and it sounds like gave you a good foundation because right. shortly thereafter, let's let's get into some pictures. You started to feel like you were making pictures that were of a consistent quality, uh, and maybe this you could tell us the story behind this image, um, and uh, we'll start talking about more of your your pictures and your approach. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so at that point, the something clicked, and I don't know, you know, if it was the combination of the workshops and the you know, all, all this and focusing on it so much. But um, up to then I had had, I had made pictures that I was proud of, but I had never consistently made pictures that I was proud of. So this is when I felt like something had clicked. This particular picture was uh, when I started shooting in Venice, I had just started shooting there for a few months and the, my, my technique was changing a little bit also on how to approach people. And I started, basically th this group you know seemed like they would be unapproachable normally i would you know before that i would have like looked at them and say oh that would make a great picture but never dared approaching them and this time i you know something clicked and i was like you know i really want this picture and i'm gonna go and approach them and ask them if it's okay for me to hang out and you know sure enough they say you know why you know what are you doing like what what is it that you're you're doing with the photos and and the first thing that came to my mind was maybe I'll do a book one day. <laughs> like this might be for a book. And I, so I, and I told them I'm doing a project now here and this might be for a book. And would you let me just be there as kind of the fly on the wall, you know, for, for a few moments and uh, just pretend I'm not there and just keep going what you're doing, what you're doing. And they, you know, I didn't expect them to say yes, but they, they were like, sure, fine. And, you know, can you share the pictures? So that kind of, that really reinforced in me this thing of you know sometimes you just got to make the the contact i know that in the industry and and in what people teach there's a lot of you have to stay invisible you ha you know you can't reveal yourself you have to do everything you know kind of you know uh, uh hiding and i this is when i felt like you know this is maybe you know sometimes it works but you get so many more opportunities and you get to work them so much better when you establish contact and build trust with your subject. So it sounds uh, like so, in this case, you actually, you know, you spoke to these guys, but we, we've got another example here. Uh, right. As I understand the story behind this, this was a little more nonverbal, but you still, it's this balance between engagement and then making yourself invisible. How, it tells us how this happened. So this one, I was actually, this one actually was shot before the, the, the that other one. And it, I, at the time I was still like trying to be invisible, <laughs> no matter what. And um, they, but they saw me and I was like, basically I did sort of a nod thing. Like, is it okay? And they were like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I, I was very close to them. I mean, this is, I'm shooting at 35. So I was like very, very close. And I didn't see the guys in the background, by the way, that that was pure luck. Uh, I, what I saw was the dogs, you know, the hair. I thought they were, I didn't know they were, um, you know, intimate either. I thought they were just friends uh, because they hadn't kissed before. Right, so right. I was just hanging out there thinking this could make a cool photo. I like the dogs and the, you know, 
know, it's like, it's kind of a neat, they're eating ice cream. And so I, I nodded and then they were like, whatever. And then I stayed there for a little bit longer and then they kissed and I literally got one shot, not noticing the guys in the back, but I had sort of pre-visualized my composition. And, and then later on, when I came home and I saw the guys looking back, I was like, oh my God, this, <laughs> this is great. So, Wait, um, you know, yeah. as, as you began to feel like there was a potential project, um, can you give us a sense Two, two questions. You know, what, yeah. what's your routine? How often are you going to, to visit uh, Venice Beach, which is 20 minutes or so, like six miles from right. where you live? Mm -hmm. So you're finding this, this project in your own, own backyard, but how yes. often are you, you visiting? Um, at the, I mean, it depended on, you know, the, the time of year and the, it's busier in the summer for sure. But at the time I was so excited to just start making consistent work. This was winter actually. And I was going probably at least once a week, maybe twice a week, uh, to shoot. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, quite regularly. And this was, uh, this one actually was in Santa Monica beach. So I wasn't at the time, I wasn't focused yet on Venice beach. I was kind of experimenting with different areas and, and uh, little by little, I was like, oh, my God, the project is really in Venice. I have to go there, just there more often. And, and, and this over how long a period of time before it becomes becomes the book? Is it almost a year or longer than that? Um, so the I think it, the next year. So I shot a lot in 2015, 2016. Then I think it was in 2016. I went to this um, a um, portfolio uh, review. Portfolio called, review, right. Yeah, yeah, Photo Lucida, which is every two years in Portland, and they, they there I was I, I came with I think fifteen prints from the Venice Beach project, uh, fifteen or twenty, and I was there to meet mostly with book publishers to just I I wasn't sure I I knew I wanted to make a book I wasn't sure when I was gonna be ready to make a book, uh, but I wanted to get smarter about the process, so that's why I went there. And, and I ended up meeting my, my publisher there. So uh, Alexa uh, from Kara Verlag, um, Alexa Becker um, was there and she looked at the work and she was very excited. And um, I you know, asked me to send, send more, more pictures. I sent her like a 50 images edit when I got home. And, and so this was all shot with the, the Leica monochrome um, and 35 uh, Sumicron. Right. Uh, right. It, this was, yeah. yeah, it was exactly. Yeah. It was the, right. the first like a monochrome. Uh, the book was the, some of the book was shot with the first like a monochrome. Um, and then the later part of the book was shot with the second uh, like a monochrome. But yeah, it tells the story. The, these first two pictures, I think, have become um, some of your most well known pictures. One, one being the cover of the book. Uh, yes. And in this, this picture that always you know, results in a reaction of why are these snakes on the beach? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yes. but these were taken in the same day those those two images or yeah these are from the okay. same shoot uh and it, it's funny because it's kind of beginner's luck because i was i got there that day and this was fairly early on in my my project and i bump into this scene of where i first saw jenna the the woman uh the mom it, with the with a snake on the ground just looking at the snake and kind of petting the snake and i was like what is going on here and I hadn't gone to Venice that much so I, I felt like okay maybe this is kind of a usual <laughs> Venice moment uh, maybe this happens a lot so I, I, I mean I I just I started kind of chatting with her and asking her what what was going on and and she explained that she was uh, snake sitting <laughs> babysitting the snakes for a street performer who was on break so I asked her if it was okay for, no, same thing as with the, uh, the guys in the street. I said, no, I, this is amazing. Do you mind if I shoot this and I'll send you some photos when I'm done and uh, just ignore me, just pretend I'm not there. And I'm, I'm, as long as you don't kick me out, I'll keep shooting this. And she was like, oh yeah, no, great. And, and she, she had her son there. So she was eager to get photos of her son with the snakes and everything. So I stayed there for uh, over 45 minutes just working the working the scene you know i was th those moments to me are gold because you're you're essentially invited in and you're allowed to stay for as long as you want and you're that fly on the wall because after a while they get bored of you they, they ignore you and they keep doing what they're doing and it's amazing in, like, in, you get in terms play. of, of tech, tech technique uh Dothan, as we we go through a, a few of these would and i know i know you you've established um 
a uh, master class online, which we'll, we'll provide some information for. And we have some uh, Leica Academy workshops coming up in September and October. Uh, right. But it, one of the things I think that makes you a very effective instructor is it is very easy in photography to talk in platitudes. And you don't do that. You uh, are very methodical in providing a methodology uh, in that gives people really actionable ways to approach different kinds of scenes. And so I'm curious, I don't know if you give me a percentage or what do you find most of the time? Are you uh, sticking around, not being a hit and run photographer, you're sticking around in an area, you're being the invited guest. Uh, that, is that more your approach yeah. than the grab shot? Yeah, I, so I love grabbing shots uh, when I can, when, when, when it's, you know, fe feasible, uh, when the subjects are distracted and, you know, there are some instances where it's great to just not be noticed. And that's still a, my preference if, if I can. Um, but I find that a lot of really, really interesting situations, most of them actually, um, require you for you to, if you're going to get a great shot, not just a okay shot, it requires for you to stay and because the moments don't all happen right when you're there. The moments can happen anytime. So to give yourself the, the time, you know, to, to, to catch those moments and also to experiment with different backgrounds, just, you know, working in the scene, which, you know, this is kind of what I learned from the, my photojournalism training. You, when you're on a scene, you have to work it. You know, the photo doesn't come right away, or it's rare that it does. It sometimes does, but not at all. But most of the time, it doesn't. So it is very much part of the methodology that I teach. That when you find something like this and you can't be um, invisible, you can't stay invisible. Then embrace it. You know, and and then you can become invisible again. You know, the fact that you come out of hiding doesn't mean that you can't become invisible again. You can become invisible again, but there's a method to get there in terms of gaining. There's no, there's no one way and you, you can move between these different modes of working. We're getting a lot right. of questions. We'll yeah. ad address it right now yeah. about um, uh, model releases. Uh, and uh, you, with the last few pictures we looked at, do you want to uh, talk about what you, your approach was and what the rules were yeah. you followed with that? Uh, I, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's a question I, I get a lot. Um, so in the US, and I, I know this is different in different countries, so I don't want to speak for, for those different uh, situations, but in the US, as far as uh, in street photography, you can photograph people without getting model releases. And you can use those pictures for, you know, publication, you can do uh, ed editorial work, you can, so you can publish a book, you can have them in a magazine. And those types of publications are not considered commercial. So the only time when it would be considered commercial is if you were going to sell them for an ad, you know, for example. So um, in that case, you would need a, a model release. So in the case so of the, yeah, go ahead. Specific, specific to that. Uh, the, yeah. the, so most all of these pictures, they're inside the book, they're taken in public space, you didn't need to have a model release. But the, the mom uh, with the snake on the, that ended up being the cover, was that a different situation because she's on the cover uh did you need a release in that, with that? um so i don't believe that i did but okay. just to be safe i did get one for just for the cover uh because i figured you know it's kind of out of my you know control but the cover could end up as an ad for, for something else like the the publisher could use it in their ad or and in that case i don't want to get in trouble so I kind of proactively asked for a model release for, for that particular one. And I had kept in touch with Jenna. Um, I actually, um, you know, photographed her later when, uh, unfortunately she got kicked out of her apartment, which is kind of a pattern in Venice. There's a lot of gentrification going on. So, um, I, I was able to, to, uh, have her, um, uh, sign me a model release for, for the cover. So you're working on this project over a period of time, and it seems like we'll go bring up the picture of the the uh, bodybuilders in, in Muscle Beach. And I've heard you talk about you really start to people start to recognize you. You become friends. They're they're inviting you to stick around. You're becoming a known person in this area, which essentially is is an extension of your your neighborhood. Uh, yeah. And I, I want to bring this up because I feel like a lot of your success has come out of a very, I don't know if it's just in hindsight, I'd love your insight on this, but it seems very intentional, very deliberate in the choices you made and, and that has led to some big breaks. And I, 
I, I'm talking about this picture and National Geographic Traveler. Can you talk about how that happened? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say I, I was um, a little bit strategic in that I had picked, at some point I made a, a point of picking Venice as, as the project that I wanted to make. And it was partly because I felt great there and I felt like I had I was getting more success, you know, in, in getting the, the pictures I wanted there than other places. But also Venice is a world known place. You know, it's a world renowned uh, tourist destination. It's the, I think it's now the first or maybe the second largest uh, tourist destination in Southern California. So it, it's, it's, you know, I, I felt like if I did work there and the work was good, then it, it would, you know, it, people would want to see it. So that was, you know, part, I guess that was part of my calculation. But um, I think beyond that, it, the fact that in, well, I, I submitted it to National Geographic to a contest and it, it ended up uh, winning, but, and I did submit to a bunch of things at the time. I don't submit quite as much anymore, but um, it, so. But, but yeah, I mean, let, me, let me come back to the, you, you, but I think this is a point where a lot of people get stuck. You submitted, but you, was it all, you know, a lot of places or were you very specific on the places you did submit? Uh, I mean, I, I think, well, yeah, I mean, I did a little bit of due diligence of, of where I was submitting. I think it's yeah. important when you when you submit your work to, to kind of be realistic about, one, realistic about where you're submitting. I, I didn't start by submitting to National Geographic. I mean, I, I, I before having... Having uh, you know more success with my uh, with my photos, you know, when I had something I was proud of. I felt you know I felt like maybe I could look, submit to a local contest or things like that. So I kind of worked up to 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 the to the National Geographic uh, stuff. Uh, but but yeah, I, w I was uh, pretty strategic about choosing things where I thought I might have a chance that was maybe a little bit of a reach. But uh, but also I, I would select. Uh, contests where the jurors looked like they might like my photos. Like I would look up the jurors and I was a little bit strategic about figuring out where to send my photos based on what people had liked before or what sort of photographers they were because oftentimes those jurors are photographers themselves. So uh, yeah, I mean, in, 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 actually in my masterclass, I dedicated a whole uh, chapter about how, how to win contests or how to, how to be successful at, at contests because I think there's a lot of is strategic things that people tend to over overlook. Yeah, I, and I love that you can speak from firsthand experience in, in the success that you've had uh, that eventually led to, to this book. Uh, the, what did you find changed in your work by going back again and again the same place? Yeah, I mean, part of it you, you've already mentioned, which is you people start to know you. Um, you start getting familiar with the spots are where things happen. Like you start uh, knowing where to go to find the interesting moments. And um, I don't know, there's a familiarity that, that comes with, with, you know, just knowing a place and, and knowing where the light hits when and where the action went, might be and when the drum circle is taking place versus the bike parade. And you just start to know the place. And I think it makes you more comfortable. Now, it's, it is a double-edged sword because you do, I think your sensitivity to what's there tends to come down a little bit. Like, it's not like the first time you go in and everything looks amazing. You, you I think, so you have to kind of keep yourself excited about the place. And uh, so that's the challenge. Let's ask you to expand on that a bit. Um, and I, I, I was directing you a little bit towards your methodology. I mean, what do you do or what did you do when you were stuck? I mean, lots of people go to Venice Beach, one of the most popular places uh, tourist wise, yeah. um, but they're not coming back with the kind of layered, emotional, uh, timeless images that, that we've just looked at. What is it you did strategically when you were stuck, when you felt like you weren't yeah. producing something new? Well, I, I have, you know, this is part of the methodology that I've kind of learned from others, developed, and then I'm teaching now. Um, I, I believe, you know, this is my, my own little world of methodology, which is th there's four different situations that I run into. And um, depending on what I feel like doing that day, which, you know, my mood can change when I go out. Sometimes I'm very outgoing and I feel like chatting people up. And sometimes I don't want to talk to anybody. And I have to, I think it's important as photographer that we um, 
our that we ask ourselves what feels good you know that that day so um those four different cases are that, that i that i find and i learned three of them you know from matt stewart originally is uh, what i now call the four f's which he used to call the three f's it's uh the fishing following i added farming and the last one he always jokes uh, jokes uh, rhymes with duck. <laughs> the last F rhymes with duck. And so th those, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail too much because I know we have limited time here, but um, I'll just give you the first one. If you're, you know, if I see a character, you know, I'm, I'm in Venice and there's characters everywhere. You know, what I mean by character is somebody dressed, you know, funny or, you know, who's trying to draw attention to themselves in their behavior, or they're, they have this giant dog that they're walking. Or, so if I see a character, then there's a mode that I, I know I can, I can click into, and there's a whole method that basically falls from, from doing, you know, doing a follow. Let's say I'm, 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 I see a character, I want to follow them to get the best shots possible. That has a whole... We, we talked a little bit about the, you know, approaching them, staying invisible first, but if you can't, then approaching them, asking them for permission to follow them. And then I get all kinds of chances to capture uh, different moments with different backgrounds and different lights and so on and so forth. So that's just one, that's just a follow method, but there's four others that I can sort of click into. And when I'm stuck, you know, to answer your question, I, will try to figure out, okay, can I see a character that I want to pursue? Or if not, you know, can I uh, find a, what I call a pond, which is, would be like a, a interesting place that would serve as a background that has beautiful light or there's a beautiful background you, and work the scene you know, that way. So let's, uh, we'll bring the Im yeah. image back up. Did you say pond? Yeah, a pond. So, a pond. so you're like, using, sorry, so we're, you're using the fishing analogy. So, uh, yes, you know, uh, that's the, right. The Jim yes, Richardson yes. Uh, quote, you know, that if um, your pictures aren't interesting, stand in front of more interesting things. That's um, right. Okay, I got you. I got you. Uh, and, but, but in a place like Venice, where there's so much going on, yeah. is there a, a technique that you used? To, two things that really stand out to me about a number of your, your images it is the interaction. It's people mm -hmm. doing other things, interacting with each other, this picture being an, an example. Yeah. And let's go inside. I think you call this next one hippie bus. Hippie van, maybe? yeah. Hippie van. Um, I, you know, you've really, you're giving the viewer the sense of what it was like to be there. Yeah. Uh, and this peak moment of, of, of interaction, right? And exchange. Um, it, how, are you conscious of that or are you figuring it out after the fact in the editing process? That so the, 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 those two pictures that you showed are very different and were different in my approach. The, the first one with the flower or the, the um, yeah, the fake flower. Um, I don't know if you can go back. Oh, to that we can one. bring it back. Yes. Yeah. So this, I just witnessed that as I was passing by and it was a very quick, like they never saw me. I went in, I took a few photos just as he was raising the flower. I don't know what they were talking about. And, and that was part of the mystery that, you know, just I was intrigued by the way he was dressed, the way, you know, she, how long she, young she looked and, and pregnant, and then the flower. And it was just a very random kind of moment. And I was like, I just raised my camera, took a few shots and walked away and they, they never saw me. And I was pretty close, as you can tell. This is cropped in slightly, but not much. And the second one in the van was what I would call now a farming situation, where it was an evolving situation involving multiple people that I ended up sort of being invited into shooting. And those are people that I had befriended before. So it was a relationship I was already building, sort of documentary style, you know, where I had met them before. I had even, they'd, they'd even asked me if I could uh, help them out with uh, some uh, um, uh, band-aids and stuff because they had yeah. you know, some cuts from some crazy stuff they had done in, on the beach. And, and then I, I was kind of following them around and they went back to the van and I was allowed to just be the fly on the wall there. So it was more of a documentary type situation. In both cases, I'm anticipating gestures. And in the case like this, where I'm getting to hang out with people, you know, you get to learn 
you see patterns and you see what what's so that that joint that he's holding is getting passed around so i i kind of anticipate what's going to happen and i'm trying to find an angle where i can separate everything and, and the challenge in all of these is to to create order out of chaos you know because <laughs> yes things yes, are all I, over the place there's dogs there's people there's legs there's arms there's you know and, and then you have to like put everything in the right place and uh, so that's the that's the challenge. But but if you're staying a while and and you have the the privilege of of being there, then then you can you know you can find your way around these things. And you know we, we're gonna I've uh, got a number of pictures to go through. And thank you everybody for questions. We're gonna weave weave these in as we we go forward. Uh, this ends up becoming your your first book, uh, which I believe the first edition is virtually sold out of uh, uh, maybe a few. Um, uh, bundled deals that you you have on your uh, website of the first edition with a print, but uh, you're now in the second edition of this. Before we we go to your your second book, your second um, your serious personal project, uh, I want to ask you: Are there strategic decisions you made that you, looking back, you feel like made all the difference in the success of this book? Um. Hmm. Well, I think one is is a common thing that I hear from a lot of people is, you know, like, because I tell my students, go do a project that that's the biggest thing you can do to advance your your photography, you know, pick a project and just and do it and 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 go back off in and so, um, you know, but but often people think of projects and they come back to me and they're like, I'd like to do this project. But you know, when I ask around people say it's been done a lot. And it's already been done. And and I got a lot of that when I started that Venice project, you know, I would tell people, I'm, this is what I'm doing. And they're like, are you kidding? You know, there's so many tourists there and so many people have done projects there. There's no way, like you, you pick something that hasn't been done. And I, I think one thing I did right with that is not listening to them because, and, and you shouldn't, yeah, you know, anybody who tells you your project's already been done, just don't listen to them because everybody has a different way of seeing things. And I think if you can bring your own vision to even the you know the Eiffel Tower, uh, then you, you can do you can do and you and but you have to do it I guess in in mind you have to keep in mind that it's been done before and you have to bring your specific vision and really have an introspection about what is it that you personally feel about this place. And very good, um, very, that's great, yeah. great, great, great advice. And I will use it as a, as a segue into you know we we, we went from the the hippie uh, bus. Uh, which I understood started getting you thinking about people uh, living in vehicles or people spending a lot of time in vehicles, Correct. which eventually then leads to your your second book. Uh, can you, as we look through a few of these shots, talk about how this started? Yeah, so um, as I was shooting the Venice Project, as you mentioned, that there was this, this photo of the hippie van that we looked at, and I noticed that there were a lot of those vans parked everywhere, and there's a, there's a, we have a big homelessness, uh, homeless population in L.A., and um, and a lot of them live in vehicles, and I was very intrigued by that. And you know, being invited in this situation, I was like, I wonder why the other one, what the other one looks like, uh, what what all the other buses and vans and what what is happening inside. And there was a lot of stigma, also. You know, people saying, you know, a lot of bad things are happening. There might be you know drugs and this and that, and it's unsafe. And so um, part of me wanted to show that that you know that that stigma was not warranted and 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 also show the diversity of, of what was happening in that it's not just all the same people that live in, in those situations there's people living in those situations for all kinds of different and so i stayed on doors essentially just behind the boardwalk so still in venice and um trying to living in those conditions to figure out got them there you know and what their history was and so i started doing taking photos of some people in those situations and they're very they're in very, you know, there were different kinds of situations and people living alone you know a man living alone a, a, a elderly woman living living alone and, and and even families as in this case which was very rare and um, I started photographing a few of them. And when I bumped into this family, um, I started taking more and more photos of them and really liking the work uh, more than what I've done so far. 
And eventually, uh, you know, I, I actually I asked um, a, a mentor of mine, a photojournalist, uh, who uh, you know told me looked at the the work and he said, oh, you should keep going with this family. Like uh, I like what you've got going on with them much more than what you have with the other ones. So I I did. Uh, so this and, is, uh, so yeah. I think two two things I'm hearing you say here that uh, the feedback you got was that rather than sort of doing a survey or, or a, a, a you know a variety of um, I look at a variety of people, the diversity of people who are living in the, in, in bands and making it either by by choice or uh, you know um, as a, as a result of not having another place to live. Um, the feedback was the more the deeper you could go, that it was better for you to go deeper with one family. And it sounds it's like it certainly has resulted in this this beautiful book. Talk to us a little bit about access, and and how you you know um, how that worked for you. And there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, if you had some difficult times, this was again a, about almost a year that you're spending uh, documenting. Yeah. So you know, I think you know, we started with my business career, and I think in business, a lot of what brought me success was initially kind of initial foolishness. Uh, not really realizing the complexity of something and just launching into it, <laughs> you know, uh, without knowing how complex or hard it was going to be. And this is a project that kind of was the same way where I, you know, I was attracted to like finding out. I had a question, you know, which was who are these people and how do they live? Uh, and and the question was so uh, intense and I, I really wanted to find the answer that I didn't realize how what kind of the complexity of this from a photographic standpoint you're talking you know because like concretely here was what we're talking about is shooting in very small environments um you know those vehicles that are you know the inside of those vehicles are, is very small um you, you're invading people's privacy right you have to gain access into very intimate quarters you know that you know, and uh, and those are people who are on the street, so they're vulnerable. And so there's a whole bunch of layers, and, and the lighting is horrible. You know, like there's just so many layers of complexity. It's like the Everest. <laughs> Once I realized what I was doing, I was like, oh my God, what, like, how am I, what am I going to do with this? Uh, so, you know, but, but you problem solve. So eventually you find solutions to each one of these things. But I think a little bit of foolishness is, is, is good from time to time to kind of, you know, Climb so, so in a combination, it says like Dotan, of, of you are deliberate. You 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 often will make a make a shot list. Uh, you you're developing a game plan, which you you, you teach in in workshops and in and online, so that you you uh, there's actionable items. But then in situations in terms of access access and personalities and relationships, it it sounds like that's something that you there's not a textbook answer to. You, you really it's very much about. Uh, Honesty, curiosity, right. uh, playing it, playing it by ear. And is there a time with this family where you chose not to photograph that where yeah. maybe you had planned? I mean, I I, I am very uh, respectful of, of the people I photograph, so I I want to make sure that they're okay, that I'm not imposing that. Um, so so yeah, gaining in the gaining access to these situations was really a matter of trust. And a lot of times, I would not shoot anything. I would just hang out and chat and just, you know, just share, even like they would ask me questions and I would, I would be honest with my answers and I would ask them questions. And, and it was just an exchange without the, without the camera, just, uh, you know, and, and I think as you gain trust, you know, people's trust and they understand that your intentions are, are pure and that, that you're, you know, you, you're serious about your work. Um, there, some of, not everyone, but in this, this case, the case of this family, they were uh, proud of, of, uh, you know, collaborating on, on the projects. And, and without giving away, you know, the, the in the time we have the, the full story, the, a lot of it's in, in the book, which is is just a very unique design in the way that you've incorporated the interviews in, in uh, the the pages of the book. This is a, 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 Brazil, a family from Brazil, uh, Mormon family. They were raised right. Mormon, and yeah. So I mean, part part of the reason why I ended up just doing the project about them is that they had so many layers of just interesting history in, in their background and just the way they lived and everything so they and they still live this way um yeah they were they, they're they're from brazil the kids were three five and ten at the time two girls and one boy and uh they you know they they, they were mormon but as they were staying in la for those 10 months that i photographed them they had doubts about their faith so they were struggling with that um they had an abortion 
And I mean, they, they, they had a whole series of things happening. Their bus broke down, so they were stuck and they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, they were getting kicked out from where the bus was stuck, so they had to figure out how to get it repaired. I mean, it, it, there was a whole saga. That, and so I felt like between the saga of what they were living while I was photographing them and what had happened to them up to then, which was, you know, that they had told me in an interview, um, I felt like I, I needed to render that in the book so people understand the context. And it just brought, you know, some of it I was able to put in photos, but some of it was from prior, you know, before me photographing them. So I wanted that to be in the book as well as, as context for, for this family. And, and, and a gear, a switch, I'll switch gears and ask you a gear yeah. question. I, you, both of these projects you use primarily the 35, but I understand it, you know, in a small space, uh, photographing inside of this, the bus, you tried a 21 and it just didn't, it didn't fit. Well, what, what, what was your objection to it? Why, why did you not stick with it? Um, it's, it's, well, you, you've done, I, I must say you've done your research really well, because I don't think a lot of people know about this, this 21 saga that I threw myself into. Yeah, I mean, when I first started photographing in those small spaces, I, that, when I realized what I was up against in terms of the, like, technical challenge of, of, of shooting there, um, I tried to problem solve as best as I could. And it just seemed, everything seemed really narrow and with a 35. So the first thing I did was to get a 21 and see, you know, try to see if that was, if that was fixing that problem. And I just didn't like composing with the 21. Um, and I didn't like how it was rendering things. And, you know, it was making all those spaces bigger, which I didn't want people to think that those were gigantic cars or buses. I wanted so the, the, to... there's a distortion factor that that didn't match with the the aesthetic yeah. you were you're going after. Well, I, it, I got you. Um, it's not it's not just the distortion. It's just that it looks you know when you look at real estate photos, people post their you know their apartment and it's like a tiny apartment, but it looks huge in the photos because they're using <laughs> some wide land. You know, I didn't want those buses to be mistaken for like a palace. I want people. I wanted people to see those vehicles for what they were, and I yeah. felt like the using too wide of a lens would not. Um, you know, would not do it justice. So I went back to the 35. Right. I, you, you know, I, I, you share in the, in the book um, that they, these parents made a choice lifestyle-wise uh, to, as they came to America, to spend time with their family and, and that this was a chance to, uh, raise, they were very deliberate um, and perhaps unorthodox in the way that they raised their children. The, the children were treated with a lot of respect um, not to be... Uh, bossed around or overruled by their their parents uh, they had equal authority and decision making it sounded like it, i remember you sharing at one point a child said no doton and turned you away uh <laughs> and you decided today's not a day to make a picture yeah but i, I want to go a little personal with you here you know you're a parent how did this experience seeing how they raised their children did it have any impact what did you learn from it did it change the way you've uh, worked I with your kids you know, um, I mean, it's not how I raised my kids, but I could totally see, like, in their kind of philosophy of life that it made perfect sense. And I think, you know, part of, I think the joy of, of doing this work, uh, you know, documentary work and street photography work, is you get to meet people that you never, never otherwise would connect with. You know, they're not in the, your same, you know, circle. They're not in your neighborhood. They're, and... I think that's there's something beautiful and really um, it's a huge privilege to to be able to to travel into those people's lives. You know, I would leave my house with my kids and you know and in my own way of living, and then within 15 minutes, I was thrown. I was in a bus with a family living completely differently from Brazil with a Mormon background. I mean, it, how amazing is that? And I didn't take a plane or anything. It was like 15 minutes to get to them. And I would get to spend my day, you know, in that mode and then come back to my family and have lived a completely different experience. So I think, you know, it's great to make good pictures. It always feels good. But I think half or if not more of the, of the joy is from those, you know, being able to travel into those lives that, that you normally wouldn't uh, well, be able to have access to. It's well said. Um, well, the response to both the books, I, I certainly, we talked about the Venice, Venice speech book and, and being in it now in its second edition, but how did the family respond once they, they saw this book? Oh, they loved it. Oh my God. They, they were, I, I kept them sort of 
aware of where we were going with the kind of creative direction of, you know, as the book was getting made and they were getting excited and they actually even participated at some point because <laughs> when the, the designer made the choice of incorporating some of the fabrics from inside the bus, like we have on the cover, for example. Um, so we all of a sudden, I, and I had shot some of them thinking we might do that, but I didn't shoot a lot and I didn't shoot enough of them. And so at some point we actually asked them to, uh, if, if they could lay that, you know, put down some of the fabrics and just do sort of scans of them so we could use them for, for uh, illustrations in the book. So they actually contributed <laughs> to the whole uh, oh, design wow. process. Wow. Yeah. And, and you, you've stayed in touch uh, you, when they're in LA, you, you, these are, it's not sort of a, a one-off relationship. It sounds like no. something that uh, continues. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we we stay in touch. Um, yeah, I I, <laughs> I even at some point I fantasize of like having uh, some kind of a, a, a van or something myself, and you know to go traveling. And and that day I want uh, I, I want Izzy to to build it for me. <laughs> so <laughs> I I had the same fantasy, but mine doesn't include the kids in the van with me. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a different fantasy. Uh, Lisa, I, I, I want to jump to, you know, it's always about what's coming next. And then we're going to, everyone, last chance to put in some question and answer. Um, I, you know, I find in doing these interviews, working with photographers with, with Leica, that photographers tend to fall into the, I mean, there's some exceptions to this, but either people who make a lot of pictures and then figure out what they're all about later, or those that have a concept for a project and then work within that concept. For you, uh, where do you fall? What, what's most effective for you? Well, I'm I'm definitely in in the second camp. Um, I you know I, I think the the ones that that can do the the first you know of, of looking back at what they have and then make a book out of it are people who have been you know professional for you know forty years and then they you know or more you know in the case like Elliot Erwitt can go back in his archive and make a book overnight you know. Of, uh, uh, and it will be amazing. Uh, I just don't have that kind of archive. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I and I, I, I'm excited about projects. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a project person. So it motivates me to just, you know, have a question or have, you know, a topic that I'm fascinated by um, and, and, and just go for it and, and try to uh, make it into uh, something interesting. But the feedback from your publisher uh, in terms of future projects, they, they noticed, or you noticed, I'm not sure who noticed first, that you have a lot of pictures of dogs. You're working in Venice Beach, so there's a Dogtown project uh, in the works yeah. out, of, out of that archive, or yeah. So yeah, I, I did notice that I had a lot of pictures of dogs. I love dogs. I, I have a dog that you know I I, I love, and I, I grew up with a dog. And so um, in, in Venice Beach, used to be in that that whole area of Venice Beach and South Santa Monica used to be called Dogtown. And so I want to make a literal Dogtown book. Uh, so right now, when I'm, whenever I'm in, in Venice, I, I mean, I shoot everything, but I particularly look for pictures that involve dogs. And, and I like how, you know, I've shot there so much. It's helpful to have like a different lens to look through. Uh, uh, so not a what do you mean? Yeah. Like you've switched lenses. You're not using the 35. No, 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 saying? no. no. I, I, a different, a different uh, focus. A different, a different uh, yeah. Camera. I see. It, Exactly. Okay. No, no, I didn't mean a, a literal lens. I meant like just, a, you know, to look at the same place through different eyes. And so, so looking for dog situations kind of, you know, is, is exciting and, and re, you know, and invigorating, especially when I've shot there so much. Very good. Very good. Well, what I, before we go to questions, um, let's talk about your latest project. I actually have a dog down here who's making noises. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk about your your latest project. You're splitting your time now, uh, not just in LA. You're where where are you? You moved. So I, I've moved half time, about half time to uh, Mammoth Lakes uh, in the in the High Sierras, uh, in the Eastern Sierra, I guess, and. Um, there, I mean, it's not a street photography type, you know, place. It's a little uh, resort town that, you know, has, you know, great uh, skiing in the winter and uh, all kinds of summer activities in the summer. So not so not so great for a street, but I was looking for other things around there. And I found this uh, ghost town that is actually very well known. It's probably the most famous ghost town in, in the U.S. It's called Bodie. And uh, it's, it's not close, close, but it's like an hour, an hour and 10 minutes from, from Mammoth. So um, I started going there and I, I, there it's a completely, you know, different type of work. 
Um, no, let's bring up, we'll bring up these pictures and, and um, yeah. as much as, I don't know how much of the secret you want to share, but um, uh, yeah. it's shot with the monochrome, right? Or M10? No, it, it, it's shot with the M10 monochrome okay. um, and, and still a 35. So I'm, I'm staying true to, uh, you know, what I've done before. And, and it's also not a composite. It's, it, it's, it's one shot made in camera. There's no double exposure or other artificial <laughs> things. It's yeah. So it's the journalistically, um, it's, it keeps it's, your journalistic uh, integrity and in that it's it's not composited at all. That's um, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And so um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna talk too much about the the approach because I'm still shooting this. But um, I found this new technique basically to render both the interiors and the exteriors uh, in the same picture in a single frame. And uh, and uh, it's it's I, I love the compositions that that come out of it. It's very different from what I normally do. It's still about people, and you could argue it's sort of in a street, but this is a street where nobody lives anymore. This is a it's an actual ghost town, and uh, and actually the the sport or the, <laughs> the difficulty there is to keep the the tourists out of the picture. So. <laughs> Because there, there's a few tourists, you know, who who uh, come through, and I have to figure out a way that you know they, they don't show up in the pictures. But it, so, but it does seem consistent yeah. in your your focus about places that are experiencing change, one way or another. Yeah. You you seem to that seems to be a through line. Uh, places in the midst of change, or families in the midst of change. Is that um, right. is it, yeah okay. yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I am fascinated. It's funny, as a kid, I, I couldn't care less about history. It was one of the, the things I hated the most, and I, I couldn't stand the, you know, sitting down for a history class. But now I'm just fascinated by it. And a place like this, when you go there, you feel like you are back in time. It really is like time travel, to the point that I've thought about calling this project time travel. But uh, I think on your website, I think it actually is listed as, yeah, as time I, travel. I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with it. But um, yeah, when I found this technique, I, I was told nobody had seen this before. And, and uh, it makes for very interesting pictures where you're trying to figure out what it is. And then when people learn that it's a one, you know, one shot exposure that's not manipulated, you know, they go, you know, especially photographers are kind of amazed. So sure, um, sure. It's, it's been really fun to shoot. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to continue to shoot that. Exciting. Well, you know, can you take uh, a few minutes here for some lightning round of questions? You up for that? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's do All it. All right. I'm going to take a look at the list here that has been brought in. Um, have you, what is your rule about paying for pictures? Do you pay for pictures? Do you not pay for pictures? Never. Um, is there, never, ever. Never, never, ever, ever. ever. No, um, I mean, this is something that marked me in my photojournalistic, uh, photojournalism training. It's when you start, when you pay somebody for a picture, they become an actor, they become a paid actor. And it's no longer, uh, you know, it can't ever be a candid photo, even if they, they, they went back to what they were doing and they let you, the, the, at that, from that point on that you paid them, they're a paid actor. So um, that's, that's out of the question. I mean, I, I you know, I'll do everything, you know, I'll give a treat to their dog. I always carry dog treats, by the way, in my bag since I've been shooting that, that dog project. So, you know, like I don't consider that paying anybody. That's, you know, just making friends with their dog. Um, I'll compliment people. Compliments are free and, you know, people appreciate them sometimes more than money. And uh, so the, all that stuff is fair game, but I, I draw the line at, at paying people. In terms of both of these books, when you... Um got ready for the final edit two two questions how many pictures roughly and can you speak to the impact of your decision to work with a professional editor on the end result uh for which book for both i guess we're both yeah both. just okay. people you know but oftentimes in workshops people come and they're either they're ready for a book and they've got way mm -hmm. too many pictures right. or not enough and yeah. so if your no, your example would be great to hear yeah it's an excellent question so I find, you know, for a book, I, what I learned, you know, I, and I learned a lot on this, like, very short journey to, like, making the, the two books. Oh, somebody's trying to contribute to the conversation here. <laughs> Keep talking to the audience. I'm going to come right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I've learned that a book, uh, typically you can get people's attention for about, you know, 
between anywhere between I'd say maybe 40 pictures to maximum maybe 100, 120 pictures. It's just really hard to keep people's attention for more than that. It's just not fair to ask people to stick around and look at a book for more than that, that many pictures. If and then, yeah. then what did you learn with your, your selection of, of an editor? You use the same editor for both books. Uh, what, what, yeah. what did that bring? Uh, what, what did they bring to the process? I mean, it, it's really hard to be fair and, and judge your own pictures. Um, even when you're editing a shoot, you know, you come back from a shoot and you look at it, you always carry the emotion of, of how it was to shoot it and how you felt about the subject and all these things that, and that taints your, your ability to judge the, the picture. So having somebody else, especially somebody who's a professional, uh, who's done this for many, many projects is really, really helpful. And, and sometimes we have a debate, you know, and, and that's also healthy to, to, to disagree and then figure out what we're disagreeing on and, and what the compromise is. I think it just makes better work to have, you know, especially a professional editor involved. Uh, but, but in terms of like the number of pictures that you, I think it was part of your question, like how many pictures do you start with? Yes. Uh, I like ending up around 60 pictures, 60, 70 pictures. That's kind of my sweet spot for a book. And so at least the books that I've done. And I find that in order to get there, ideally you want 300 plus pictures to edit down from. So those are not 300 pictures you shot. Those are 300 pictures that you selected as being the best ones. So you need to sacrifice a lot of those to, you know, and, and you know, that's what makes the, the quality of the final book is compressing, you know, 300 great pictures into, you know, 60 that are even better at, at telling the story. Well, you know, I, I know in your online workshop and we have uh, these two workshops coming up in Venice Beach as we, we return to in-person in programs uh, in September, there's two spots left and then we added some dates uh, in October. We get into workflow and, and editing, uh, both of which um, I, I certainly very, very important part of the, the process. You're sponsored Absolutely. by DxO uh, or you work with, work with DxO. So um, can you speak to your... Uh, in a broad strokes, um, for the audience, what, what do you think the biggest mistake people is people make in their processing? What's a mistake people should avoid? Well, there's, I mean, the, what I see with students is typically two different kinds of mistakes that are almost opposite. One is, you know, the people who don't really know how to. Well, there's editing and processing. So let me make that that uh, dichotomy sure. first. Uh, and and in photojournalism, which I believe street photography is 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 sort of a part of. Editing is just picking the best pictures. It has nothing to do with changing anything in the picture. It's just picking the best pictures. And then processing is actually processing the picture. So uh, in editing, there's all kinds of mistakes that get made because people don't really know what to look for. So one of the things I teach is what makes a great, great street photograph and what's, what's an objective criteria that you can use when you edit your own pictures so that you're not pulled too much by all these kind of um, you know, by all the, the emotional attachment that you have. So that's one thing that's with editing. That's the toughest thing is to, to, to have a, an objective criteria. And that's a learned thing. Then when you're processing the, the mistakes that I see is either people don't know the tools, so they don't really bother. Like they, they're like, you know what, this stuff is too technical. I'm just, my picture looks great without processing. And they just use their pictures without processing. And I think that's a mistake because you can make a picture so much better with some processing. I think it's well, especially yeah. a good point when you're working with the monochrome. Uh, the monochrome has, you know, all of the latest sensors uh, that you're working with from, from Leica have a huge latitude in terms right. of dynamic range. But, the, you know, that monochrome in particular, uh, it has, uh, I, I think could be for many people uh, underwhelming if you do no processing. Absolutely. Uh, that Absolutely. requires, um, like we would with a, a negative, uh, requires yeah. some finessing in the final product. Absolutely. Yeah, it has so much detail in the shadows that you can pull. And if you're not taking advantage of that, you're only taking a, advantage of like half or less of the, you know, the, the, the image uh, that you're getting. So it's, it's kind of a waste. So that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, I do see people who process way too much. <laughs> <laughs> and or and or don't really aren't aware of, of photojournalistic rules that apply to street photography and they're like photoshopping things out or in and that's also not not okay for for street photography so there's there's a whole bunch of things definitely that are worth uh, teaching in, in that 
arena that, that can make a big difference in, in people's photographs. Yeah, I want to circle back here as we, we start to wrap up. I want to thank everybody for being here. If you've got one or two more questions, last chance, put them in. We might have a chance to, to get one more or two more in. So I'm going to circle back to working on projects and then making pictures and then figuring it out later where they fit. And it's when we're teaching, um, often the recommendation, you know, have your camera with you, make pictures every day. And, and I think that's uh, certainly proven itself to be a very valid way of, of working. But I wonder if the way that you were working in 2015 um, is now how that's changed uh, in relation to this idea of projects. And, and do you separate your personal life, your family pictures, your vacations? Do you see that as something different than these, uh, your, your ongoing you know, documentary projects? Yeah, um, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> that was, I mean, my photography was a little bit of a source of conflict at one point, because I, I got so just obsessed with it that I was carrying my camera everywhere. And, uh, we, you know, we would go on vacation. And I think that it, we came to a head in like in Peru, at some point, <laughs> where my wife was like, either you're, you know, taking photos for your work, or you're, you're spending time with us, but you, we can't be doing both. So, uh, which I totally understand It's like, I, uh, so I, from from that point on, I decided, you know, my family time was, you know, iPhone, you know, I, I bring my phone, that's it. And I take pictures for the family. And if I document a trip, it's about the family as the central characters. It's not about the, the place. Uh, and then I'll carve out a time that I'll, you know, if I want to work professionally and, and take photos that, you know, for my own work, I'll carve out the time and say, is, is it okay if I go, you know, from like four to six, there's a market I want to go to and I'll go by myself with my Leica and I'll, I'll, you know, be seriously working that without any kids in tow or anything like that. That's so, interesting. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, I find especially uh, photographers working in journalism and uh, the documentary realm. Um, I mean, this is again, a blanket statement. There's certainly exceptions, uh, but that when you start to do it for a living, Right, that you start to separate uh, this professional yeah. focus uh, right. versus that downtime with with family. I, I mean, there's there's certainly different uh, exceptions to that. Uh, Chris Anderson's book, uh, Son, uh, right. I, one one of the, my favorite books that certainly come comes to mind. Yeah, um, it was a great book. But it, but it sounds like in terms of just you know from your professional experience, uh, being working with in, uh, intention setting goals. Uh, that separating, giving yourself dedicated time has been really important on the projects. Yeah, it, it is. I, I have to put, I actually kind of put myself in a mind space uh, when I go and shoot a project. I mean, there's all kinds of, it's, it's funny because like there's probably sports analogies to that in terms of like athletes that go into the, you know, they, they go into their the zone. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I, like, I put certain kinds of music on, on my way to the shoot. And like, I, I I'm, I, yeah, I get into the song. Zone. Give me a song. What do you, what's, what's the song? What comes to mind? <laughs> Quick, top of your head. You uh, I mean, it, it, it changes with my mood lately. I've, I've really liked to listen to Tool, to the band Tool uh, on my way to shoots. Uh, it's just kind of very creative, like energetic vibe and, and uh, just, you know, very complex rhythms. And so that seems to work for me lately. Um, it, it changes over time though. <laughs> very good. Well, let's, let's bring up a slide. I want to tell people how to, uh, to get your books, uh, which your website is a, a great place to find, uh, not only both the books, but also the, the bundle of the first edition with a print. Uh, anybody in the LA area, just quick tip secret, uh, there might be a couple of the first editions available. If you go to the, uh, the LA Leica store, uh, talk to the folks there, you might still find a couple of those. And I think, uh, but, I think, I think they're signed too. So, ah, they're signed. Okay. <laughs> a, a reason to go. <laughs> they go found the, the box store. in the back at some point. And that, so these are like, these are not available anywhere else. I think I have probably the last stash of those here. But if you go to Amazon, you'll get the second edition. If you go anywhere else, any other bookstore, the second edition. Um, yeah, Leica Store has just a few more. And I, and I have a few here that I sell with prints. Well, I want to put up your, your Instagram, uh, which we also put in the, the chat window. Uh, it's a great way to, fo to follow your work, find out about upcoming workshops. Uh, speaking of which, you just want to share those dates coming up for September 
and October dates. Uh, again, the only two spots left for the September program. And then ongoing, um, which there's some videos out there, I encourage people to Google your name on YouTube and you'll find some other references to your ongoing uh, masterclass in street photography and the methodology, which, you know, I, I, again, I commend you, uh, Doton, of taking the learnings uh, since 2015 and then adopting them into your own philosophy, your own way of working, and then being very transparent um, in not only where your inspiration came from, but then also how you've, you've made it your own uh, with your own projects. Well, thank I think you. That definitely comes through. Uh, I think we are almost to the end. Yeah, this is it. Uh, did, I, did we cover everything? I you think so. I mean, that, yeah, I, I, the only, I mean, the, the one link that probably people have made in their minds now, even though we didn't like actually speak about it, is in that whole methodology approach is because, you know, I, I, did, I wasn't trained as an artist. I was trained as a uh, computer engineer. And, you know, I, I realized through, throughout my career in, in high tech that methodology was really key in getting results. And, um, and I think I'm, I'm a pretty results oriented person just by nature. So when I approach photography and when I teach it, it's, it's also very results oriented. And, um, so, it, you know, I, I love I, it. I I think it, 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 it's well said it, it's uh, in a world where, um, there are, it, again, it's easy to get into platitudes. Uh, just do what, what feels good, be open, uh, just keep doing it and you'll find a style. You right. overcome all of those things with really actionable items, both in in-person and online. And I, um, we, could, we could spend a number of hours getting deep into them, uh, right. but we'll leave that for a future talker for people to see you in person. Doton, you, uh, you've been on my list uh, of photographers I've wanted to talk to for a while. So I'm so glad and I appreciate that you were able to spend this time and for everybody who tuned in, thank you very much. Uh, we will eventually post this on YouTube so you can review it if we talk too fast or you want to go back and write anything down. Um, thank you all for being here. The next Like a Conversations, just a little preview, will be August 12th with uh, photographer Matt Day, photographer and YouTuber Matt Day. So write that down, uh, August 12th, 4 o'clock Eastern. Until we see you next time, be safe, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dotan. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Take care. Bye.